Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's Design News Webinar, Successful Application of Aluminum Extrusions for Automotive Components, sponsored by Aluminum Extruders Council and broadcast by Informa. I'm Michael Krieger. I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. First of all, this webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share the webinar, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event, and toward the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please just take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback provides us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. And lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, <laughs> Just click the help widget found at the bottom of your screen or type your issue into the Q&A area and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now on to the presentation, successful application of aluminum extrusions for automotive components. Discussing today's topic is Ben Kuhn, sales manager for Canada at Almag Aluminum and Sarab Seda, principal advisor, VAP North America for Rio Tinto at Rio Tinto. To learn more about our presenters, just visit the bio switches. Ben, thanks, and over to you. All right, and as Michael said, uh, welcome to today's discussion. We will be talking about uh, aluminum extrusions in automotive components, both where they've been successful and where we see um, success coming and how we can achieve that. So my name is Ben Kuhn. I'm a member of the sales team at Almag Aluminum. I have a background in um, engineering and project management before finding myself in sales. And I'm excited to be here and talk to you today a little bit about um, trends we see and best practices. Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. My name is Saurabh Seda and I'm uh, the principal advisor for value added products in North America. Uh, my background is I'm a metallurgist um, and I've worked in the aluminum, aluminum industry for about 10 years and I've been with Rio Tinto for uh, six plus years. My, my main topic uh, is uh, supporting all of our billet customers that uh, uh, extrude aluminum. Okay, great. So um, just a little bit about AEC, um, Almag, and Rio Tinto. So the AEC, uh, as we talked about, member putting on this event uh, today, or at least uh, bringing a lot of the, the right people together, is comprised of um, 60 extruders in North America, accounting for over 80% um, of the extrusion produced in North America. Um, a great tool and resource you'll find as we work through this. Um, Almag Aluminum is a member of the AEC with extrusion, uh, fabrication, and, and locations in Ontario, Canada, New Jersey, and Alabama. Uh, we really focus on highly engineered custom solutions, uh, whether that's fully fabricated or, or painted. Our, our intention is to provide a, a turnkey part for our customers. Um, and one thing we're quite proud of is we've been a member of the Best Managed Companies uh, Canada group for seven years, uh, most recently being awarded platinum status in 2021 uh, and carrying forward that to today. Uh, Sarb, you want to tell us a little bit about Rio Tinto? Sure thing. Uh, Rio Tinto is, is a mining company at, at the core. And, you know, we work, we, we mine many different products uh, such as iron ore, uh, copper, and uh, we have operations producing aluminum all over the world. Uh, most of the operations in North America are actually in Quebec and Canada. Um, and th as a company, it's vertically integrated, uh, business producing responsible uh, aluminum. We produce some of the highest quality, low lowest carbon footprint because of hydropower uh, that's available to us in Quebec. And uh, most recently, we've uh, partnered with Alcoa to to produce Elisys uh, or develop Elisys, which uh, is a, really a breakthrough technology in producing carbon-free aluminum. Okay, great. So let's let's get into some of the content and let's talk about um, aluminum extrusion usage. So you know the, this graph's showing some projections, but as you can see, it's got r really current data right up to 2022. 
certainly been an increase in the use of aluminum and extruded aluminum shapes in vehicles. We've seen a hundred percent increase uh, over the, the kind of the last decade, and the forecast is, is set to exceed that. You know, there's some vehicles such as the F-150 and uh, l more recent Corvettes that are, um, you know, very heavy users that would certainly uh, surpass the pounds per vehicle estimated here. And we're seeing that um, become more common. When we look at other uh, modern takes such as EVs, you know, the Mustang Mach-E is a great example of a vehicle based on steel architecture. Um, so still using a large uh, amount of steel in, <clears throat> in the, the fabrication uh, and assembly of this vehicle. However, um, despite that, you know, still surpassing some of those averages we're seeing with over 108 pounds uh, of extrusion being used in the battery enclosure alone. Uh, so that's not including some other components such as bumper beams and crash management components that do exist on th these vehicles today. So, so the message here is, um, um, you know, there's, there's those that are really embracing aluminum extrusion content in vehicles. Um, but even the, even though there's, you know, the right application for steel in those places, um, the vehicles that do have primarily steel structures still uh, leaning and trending more and more towards extruded aluminum content. So, so aluminum in, in general is a, uh, you know, very good strength to weight ratio. So as, as Ben mentioned in EVs, uh, one of the key uh, drivers is uh, battery range. And when you want to add range, you need to add more batteries and that adds more weight. So aluminum really becomes a natural ally uh, for reducing the weight. And in, in that, you end up using that in, in many different forms uh, in, in, the, in the vehicle, uh, primarily the cross members, you know, the battery box these days is, is multi-aluminum, uh, uh, whether it's sheet product or extrusions, but majority of the, the, the crash components and protecting the batteries, uh, that's all done by aluminum extrusions. And because of... Uh, the way the aluminum is, uh, a lot of the trim and accessories uh, are also made by aluminum. Uh, you can tweak chemical compositions as such that it produces a, a fine finish, which many of the automotive OEMs prefer. So these are some of the applications that, uh, that, that are currently in use. The most common and the most famous is probably the Ford F-150 rock, rocker. You know, as uh, Ben mentioned, they were one of the first to embrace the, the aluminum usage in vehicles. And uh, if you look at a Ford 150, uh, you know, that, that's very in aluminum intensive. So looking at the Mustang Mach-E, you have the bumper beam extension, the crash can, uh, and, and, and you have a battery enclosure as an example for the XC40. Great. So those are some good structural applications. And a lot of times we tend towards thinking about those, but uh, we wanted to highlight here that there are also another, you know, whole group of products that are using aluminum extrusion and, you know, bringing together that total usage per vehicle. So we have some medium duty products uh, such as suspension components and cross members. Um, but there's also a lot of um, step products like the multi-pro tailgate and vehicle running boards. There's uh, highly aesthetic products such as um, pillar covers, you know, really complicated, intricate extrusions for window guides, roof rail systems, as well as a lot of uh, thermal management. You know, that, you know, that's been around pre-EV and it's certainly becoming a main component of the EV vehicles as well, where you have these um, small, complex extrusions that are able to dissipate a large amount of energy uh, very efficiently and have good good surface contact with that uh, heat generating product. A quick comment on that to uh, add to that, Ben, is that yeah. uh, the, the, the last the micro channel extrusion thermal management, uh, corrosion protection, corrosion resistance is of utmost important because uh, you have fluid flowing through those micro channels, and that's it, it, that, it, aluminum becomes uh, another natural uh, choice for that. 
Yeah, great point. Thanks for adding that, Saurabh. And you will see Saurabh and I um, dialogue back and forth on some of these slides as we progress. So um, <clears throat> an example here, and just kind of to, to drive a point home. So 20 years ago, um, when we look at that, that, that generation 4GT and its heavy usage of aluminum extrusion, that was really, you know, it's only a couple decades ago that only supercars were really using um, that intensive of aluminum um, component frame and suspension details. Whereas today, um, you know, the Corvette, which is obviously still a very high performance vehicle, but certainly a much, much higher volume vehicle, um, has a very similar um, composition when you look at like where and how aluminum is being used. Uh, you know, it's, it's also advanced since then. You can tell there's a lot more organic shapes. So how that aluminum is being uh, manufactured and processed has improved. And we're seeing that um, on a number of vehicles now. You know, Cadillac CT6 would be another good example uh, of a high volume platform that's seen a very intensive substructure like seen here. So, so now that you have a brief introduction of where the extrusions are heading and how they're being utilized in uh, today's automotive world, let's uh, briefly check out what we're going to be talking about today in, in, uh, in the webinar. Uh, we'll, we'll look at why and how of extrusions. We'll look at the keys of success. Ben's going to talk about the geometry. I'll touch up uh, on the alloy microstructure and we'll kind of, as, as he mentioned, we'll kind of bounce off of each other and uh, kind of make this a, a, a tag team event. So uh, finally, we'll, we'll touch uh, a little bit about the carbon uh, offset and uh, what it looks like in the industry today. So let's, let's take a look at what aluminum brings to the table. You know, it's, it's lightweight, a uh, high strength to weight ratio, as I mentioned, corrosion resistance. And the best part is it's infinitely recyclable. Um, and, and if you look at the extrusions, uh, really it's any shape that you'd like. Um, it's, it's tailored to, to perform the way any extruder, extruder's uh, capabilities are. Uh, they're suitable for complex integral shapes, uh, mostly easy to fabricate. Uh, you can join multi, Join it with multi-materials. They tend to be cost-effective if uh, if you can do your process optimization properly, and best of all, shorter production lead times. All right. So now we're gonna we're gonna talk about the process a bit. And I will admit, I was raised in the '90s, and this imagery resonates with me um, on a personal level. However, it also is incredibly applicable to the aluminum extrusion process. So one thing I like to point out here, um, if you look at the image on the left, you have the green Play-Doh coming through. It looks like a leaf shape. And just to the right of that is the die form for the tube um, that's being extruded on the right-hand image. And you can see how that center geometry is created, how that hollow tube is created. And very similarly with uh, aluminum, you have similar types of support tooling creating that inner geometry. And it's the temperature and pressure condition uh, within the die that allows that material to weld back together and create a seamless product like seen, seen here with a Play-Doh press. Um, the other parallel is that, uh, and, and sometimes misconception is that aluminum similar to Play-Doh stays in its current state. You know, it gets hot, it's warm, um, but it never is a liquid during the extrusion process. So it's flowing um, in a solid state. So this is what it looks like when we move to aluminum. We have a, a preheated um, aluminum billet, regardless of the alloy, that billet, or certainly the primary alloys that are used in automotive applications, uh, that billet is preheated. It's being um, pushed using a, a hydraulic ram through an extrusion die. That extrusion die is um, supported by a bunch of other tooling components. You know, there's two shown here, uh, an extrusion die and a bolster. It's not uncommon for this, this tool stack to, to grow to five, six, seven components to really take that tonnage and, and disperse it accordingly. And then of course we have the exiting geometry or profile that, uh, 
that's been um, wire EDM cut into that tooling. All right, so to achieve the desired properties and really to give you some insight into the aluminum extrusion process, and this is one reason um, I'll just uh, plug this in here that uh, you know, Almag is proud to be an AEC member, and I'm sure Rio Tinto is as well, is their willingness to share information. You know, it's not, this is the aluminum extrusion process and we don't want others to understand it. It's no, we, we want you to understand this. So we're gonna take you through some details here that will really help shed some light on how aluminum extrusion is done. And the intention is that it will allow you to more effectively design and utilize and understand conversations and dialogues with your, with your supply base. So to achieve uh, both a dimensionally stable and mechanically uh, stable or like achieve the mechanical properties and extrusion, there's a few details that need to be met and they are almost all surrounding temperature control. So first we need the proper metal temperature to flow through the die to put the alloying elements into solution. So the billet is preheated. However, the tooling and the container that the aluminum is in is also preheated. So there's additional temperature controls there. We can't have that aluminum being cooled down too quickly. And although the tools are made of a very hard steel, such as H13, um, there is calculated deflection. And so they have to be preheated for that to be successful. We get the aluminum up to temperature using the mechanical work of the hydraulic ram pushing the aluminum through the die, and then we have to quench it. Um, depending on the alloy, there's different quench rates that need to be achieved, but the extrusion process has put the magnesium and silicone into solution, which allows them to be well distributed throughout the grain structure of the metal, which Saurabh will uh, elaborate on for us shortly. And now we need to lock that in. So we need to cool down the aluminum and put, keep that magnesium silicone dispersed as it has been by the, the extrusion process, but we also can't cool it too quickly and cause distortion in the metal. So there's a fine line there and each alloy will have specific requirements. And then finally, um, proper aging is required. So the extrusion process and the right quench rate are really setting you up for success, but the metal hasn't actually um, achieve the mechanical properties yet you need to do artificial aging in order to achieve that. Um, the only uh, caveat here would be if you were going to do like a bending operation, say to a product, you might interject that between step two and step three currently shown on the screen and then age it after that forming operation is done. So this graph essentially represents the entire journey that an extrusion takes. So on the left side, you have a billet supplier dependent operation. They're the ones that cast the billet, um, they homogenize it, and then they make it ready for an extruder to, to actually extrude the billet. So the homogenization practice, what it does is uh, essentially it, it reduces the flow stress of the billet. So aluminum in general has uh, iron content uh, and some of the alloying elements also have iron content and the way it exists and in an as cast condition, uh, it tends to be very sharp. So when you homogenize it, you, you instead of a sharpening effect, you kind of soften the effect of iron, which helps push it through the die. Uh, as Ben mentioned, before you can push it through the die, you have to preheat the, the billet. And again, you do that to reduce, uh, further reduce your flow stress uh, so that it becomes easier to push through the die. Um, and then when you extrude, you're taking the extrusion temperature above uh, a, a solvus temperature, which again puts the mag and silicon in solution. Now, the key takeaway here is that, uh, you know, it, in, in, in real estate, when you go purchase real estate, it's all about location, location, location. In, uh, in the world of extrusion, it's all about temperature, 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 and then some. So any temperature that you can monitor and uh, control, uh, it means that you're going to be controlling your extrusions uh, going forward. So the more you have, the more control you have your, uh, over your temperatures, the more control you have over your process, the more consistent your properties are, and the happier your uh, your automotive customers are. So we've. Uh, 
done a brief primer, kind of given a brief overview, and Ben's going to talk about uh, the geometry of the extrusions. Okay, great. Thank you. Moving on here, we have uh, a relatively um, common slide. Some of you may have seen it, and it's really just terminology. So to just shed some light on what kind of jargon extruders might use when you're in discussion with them, solids, semi-hollows. Uh, semi-hollows are so also sometimes referred to as shutoff profiles, and then hollows. Um, you know, there's a few different classes of hollows, um, although they're, they're not so commonly used, um, but there definitely is an important differentiator to, to understand the difference between a solid, a semi-hollow, and a hollow profile. So there are a huge range of shapes that, you know, have been successfully extruded to date, and I'm sure there will be, continue to be evolution in the technology. Um, <clears throat> but there are a few general design principles that can be followed when you're trying to target a very cost-effective product. And I, I want to really flag that before I bring the rest of the content up. And it's distracting. Um, these are guidelines for when you really need something to be um, low cost and uh, it's maybe not a key design detail. These, So here's some examples. So uniformity. Um, if you can have uniform wall thickness, it does present an improved condition for the extrusion party. So you can see a couple examples here of where shapes are using um, unique wall section areas in different locations. Another example uh, that will optimize the extrusion process is symmetry. Um, one of the big challenges of extrusion is not um, getting a die cut to specification, but it's the flow of the aluminum. And for an extrusion to be successful, it all has to leave the extrusion die at the same rate of speed. And it really becomes a flow challenge, a material flow challenge. And when something is symmetrical, um, the porting and to balance out that flow is a little bit more natural process. Smooth transitions. Sharp corners can present some challenges. Um, the biggest of which is, is actually just a tooling longevity thing. Anytime you have a concentrated uh, point in, in the tooling, it, it's an accelerated wear zone, and those tools have to be replaced more frequently. And as a result, it's typically a, a cost driver. And lastly, um, intersecting walls. So we're calling it an enhanced visual surface. So what you'll see here is where you have those two screw ports that are circled in the bottom right. They are intersecting perpendicularly to a large horizontal surface. And it's quite likely that there will be some visual read through um, where those occur down the length of the part. That visual difference um, is a result of varying cooling rates in the quenching process due to the kind of localized increased mass of the component. And so you get a slightly different grain structure on the surface, which um, certainly can be visual. So one option is to um, actually create a visual detail that's going to help blend that in, whether it's like some stipple along the surface or other, other small grooves to hide it. That will help the extruder run the pro product at an elevated rate of speed without the risk of having visual nonconformances. So I prefaced all that um, because although those are good dot um, design guidelines, they really um, should only be referenced when you really need it. And so I, we were, I'm excited to talk to you about this slide right after because it does show um, how a total cost approach can still be achieved and really benefit from the extrusion process. <clears throat> These two parts, in solo, solid and hollow geometry were designed to achieve the same thing. The solid geometry was the original intended design. Um, the extruder that received this image or this product to quote, asked some questions and said, you know, why do you have so much metal in the middle? What secondary processing are you doing to this part? 
part of the reason they ask those questions is because the design as presented is not actually extrudable. And again, an extrusion die could be cut to that geometry. However, um, path of least resistance suggests that there's simply too much mass in the center of this part. And as a result, the outer geometry is unlikely to fill. So the aluminum is going to want to flow towards the middle. And there's not enough uh, port work that can be done up front to encourage that aluminum to flow away from the center and fill these outer fins. And what was learned during this kind of case study was that the material was placed, um, you know, of course, for that initial thermal transfer, this is a, a, a heat sink component, um, but they needed metal in a lot of places to do some drilling and tap tapping operations for a mating component that was coming to it. And, you know, because the extruder asked the questions and because the customer had come to them at a time where the product was not design frozen, um, they were able to collaborate and come up with this solution on the right hand side. And although it looks like a lot more complicated part in many ways, this part actually is manufacturable. So that's a big check mark right there. Yes, we can proceed and produce this part. Um, but also completely removed all the secondary machining operations that were going to be done. So they were able to integrate a screw port um, and a self-tapping fastener solution in every location where they needed to attach something. They maintained the large surface area contact that they needed for the heat transfer. And although the overall mass of the unit was reduced, the surface area uh, was increased such that the thermal performance outperformed the originally presented concept. So just a, a really good example of, although a hollow geometry can sometimes be more expensive, it can sometimes be more expensive. Uh, it's a great example of, you know, this part embodies those design features. However, it went from being an unfeasible design to something that was manufacturable and provided a total cost solution um, as a result of all the secondary operations being removed. So a, a great example of that is the Lotus Evora. Um, so, you know, Ben mentioned some of the geometric restrictions or limitations, but the alloys themselves also have limitations because of the co chemical composition. Um, they're, they're, they have certain limitations in terms of performance. Uh, that's why they're characterized as uh, medium strength alloys, high strength alloys, or uh, softer alloys. So if we look at really the cutout or, or, or body in white uh, scan of the Evora, you could see that there's tons of multi-material being used from you know, steel um, and also aluminum 6060 extrusions. Uh, the key takeaway here is that they didn't let those limitations um, really affect the design of, uh, of the vehicle. So what they did was they used component geometry it, and to really offset those limitations. And they, oops, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, and, and they use uh, hollows and uh, to offset the lower strength of the preferred 6060 alloy. So 6060 tends to be on a little bit on the, on the softer side or the medium side uh, of strength. So what they did was they, they looked at more complex geometries of uh, extrusions to offset that. Yeah, and I, and I would just add in some cases, it's uh, not necessarily more complex geometry, but simply more evolved or more um, space specific. So just having that spatial awareness of like, what space can we use here? Um, maybe the, the geometry is not more complex, but by simply having a larger version of that part uh, the strength is able to be achieved. Okay, so um, <clears throat> really the, the summary there to those design points is that, you know, we want to encourage you to design in functionality. You know, think of the secondary processes that you're doing, what's being added to this part, how is it being finished, what materials do I need to join? Um, and I open up that discussion with the potential supplier because they might have ideas from other segments that they can kind of cross-pollinate with you. 
Um, there are details that can enhance uh, joining with other materials. Um, there's details that be, can be integrated that will help with the assembly, uh, improve heat dissipation beyond just geometry. There's special alloys out there. There are other uh, little tricks, micro serrations and things like that that can be helped to um, improve surface area of a given area. Um, they can also create an aesthetic detail or help hide what's likely to be a, a common blemish. So really something to consider and something to engage uh, with, with a potential supplier on. So, so let's let's take a look at the alloys here. Uh, as of September 2023, uh, there's there's about 75 aluminum alloys. There are 531 registered alloys today and counting. Um, there's over 118 variants in of 6000 series, which is really the main bread and butter of the aluminum industry. Um, and really, if you think about it, a variant of an alloy can be uh, so the way it works is 6063 has a published or aluminum association publishes a an acceptable chemical composition range of say 6063 6005a um, now if you picture this box that says 75 531 let's say that entire box is the chemical composition range uh, provided by the aluminum association so if you pick any let's say the word in right if you if you pick the word in that would be a variation of 6063 similarly if you pick the word today that would be a variation of 6063 really uh depending on your target uh, properties and what you want the extrusion to behave like uh most producers will be able to toggle or tailor your chemical compositions to the way you want the aluminum to perform Now, here's the AA alloy char characterizes, uh, or the naming convention is basically based on um, their main alloying ingredients. So 1000 series is as close to uh, pure aluminum as it comes, um, mostly 99% or more, and they're used in applications that require some electrical conductivity, good corrosion resistance, and they tend to be very soft. Um, so a lot of cabling, a lot of uh, you know, drawn tubes for uh, HVAC market. Those are the kind of applications the 1000 series will use. Uh, 2000 series, uh, copper is the main alloying ingredient. Uh, it, it provides low corrosion resistance, but uh, also leads to higher strength. <clears throat> and as such uh, uh, is used in a lot of aerospace applications. Uh, 3000 series is manganese, uh, so it provides very good corrosion resistance, and that's why it's primarily used in the HVAC and refrigeration market, providing uh, cooling and uh, uh, microchannel uh, extrusions. Uh, silicon is used in the 4000 series, not really extruded that much, but the most common application in the automotive industry is uh, the ABS breaking blocks. Uh, they provide good wear resistance because of the silicon present. Uh, 5000 series, again, not really used in a lot of extrusions, but because of magnesium provides very good corrosion resistance. Uh, 6000, uh, again, most popular extrusion alloy alloys used. Uh, they can be really tailored to provide a multitude of uh, strength and uh, formability and uh, then you have the 7000 series, which can be on the softer side with zinc addition, but you add copper. They really, really provide good, uh, uh, good resistance, uh, corrosion resistance, as, uh, as well as uh, toughness to the alloy. I'd also use a lot in aerospace applications. Uh, most typical extrusion tempers will be the T1, T4, and uh, T5 and T6. Um, we can we can go into the tempers uh, a little bit uh, later. Now, some of the alloy characteristics commonly used in um, in these in the automotive industry. I'm not going to read through all of them, but uh, just to provide a, a quick overview, 
the 6060 and the 6063 pr probably will provide the most amount of ductility, which helps in crash applications. So that's why they tend to be used in bumper applications and crash can applications. Uh, 6061 is probably the most uh, kind of like the bread and butter it's used in a lot of tractor trailer uh, applications. Uh, we have some 6082 that are higher strength can be used for uh, battery box protection um, or, or structural beams uh, off the battery box. Uh, the 6008 alloy is an interesting choice. It, it does provide high mechanical properties and, uh, it, and it's used in crash applications, but uh, it does have, it does come at a cost. It has vanadium uh, addition and uh, because of that it it really introduces a, a little bit of a, a speed bump at extruders for uh, scrap segregation okay and uh, <clears throat> wanted to share this with you just to kind of give a good picture of those alloys that have been discussed and where they are so this this graph is uh, along the X, magnesium and Y, silicone content, and you can see as those increase, so does the strength of the product. But just gives you a good idea of where things fall. It's important to note that 6063, you know, because there are so many registered variants, you can start to see some overlap on the 6061 and 6005A, 6008 area now, um, which, is, which is just an important thing to recognize. I'd also like to point out, you know, 6060 really on the low end, um, and yet that Lotus uh, example that Saurabh spoke about was using that alloy for um, applications such as bumper beams and chassis structural components where we typically would default to a higher strength alloy. And so that's not always the case. These are just examples. Saurabh, I'm curious, being on the material supply side, are there industry any industry trends you're seeing um, where alloys are being used more commonly um, and or, you know, alloys are being used for new applications that maybe previously weren't, weren't um, common? Uh, yeah, Ben, uh, you know, the, the, automotive, the automotive industry and extruders are always looking for alloys that simplify things for them. In terms of extruders, they, they like alloys that run well in their system, in their extrusion facilities. Uh, but also they can provide the, the right, or they can provide the mechanical properties that their customer is looking for. So if they're able to somehow uh, find an alloy that can solve two purposes, it reduces a lot of lead time, it reduces a lot of production time at their facility. So um, it's like, for example, a 6005A these days is being, is used, is starting to be used for crash applications more and more. Um, and uh, the 6008 seems to be a little bit you know, phasing out. Um, and it, it's also because it requires a lot of quench. It's a quench sensitive alloy. Um, so really the, it, it's, it's being driven by capabilities and the requirements that the OEMs are, are given us. Right. Uh, as in, sorry, please go ahead. Right. So I was just going to say then, so I guess sounds like you're seeing a shift towards some of the lower um, strength alloys becoming slightly more common um, because of some of the, you know, the costs affiliated with processing the higher strength alloys. Then is that is that like reading between the lines? Uh, not necessarily. That you know the the crash alloys they have a separate requirement. A lot of you'll see in the automotive world, there's the nomenclature being thrown around is is uh, like C20 or CA20 or C24. Uh, what that really means and that they're targeting a specific mechanical property. Uh, but along with that, they have specific requirements on and how um, that extrusion will will fail and absorb energy. A lot of that uh, is also measured by VDA testing. So, uh, you know, things are evolving. The automotive uh, designers want a thinner profile. So really, you want to increase the, the strength of the alloy. Uh, at the end of the day, you, you need to find the right balance between the design the alloy and the capability that the extruder could bring to the table. Okay, thank you. So let, let's take a look at a, a quick example of, uh, of, of what Ben was talking about and how you add alloying elements in an alloy and what really, how it affects it. 
so if you look at uh, standard 6063, uh, you know, just looking at the nominals from the a published AA range, um, you know, you end up with a typical strength of 230 megapascals for, uh, for a T6 temper. Uh, but then when you increase the silicon content, the iron content, the, the manganese, uh, really you end up getting a much more, a much stronger alloy. Uh, and you end up getting a typical strength of 310. Now, the way we, we look at it is the 6063 would call it a much leaner alloy, so it would extrude better, uh, faster than a 6082. And and one of the reasons is because of the, al the alloying elements that have been added. So looking at the alloying elements, uh, you know, based on what, your customer needs. Um, there's there's many tweaks that you can do. Um, a lot of it's done to affect uh, what you want the extrusion to do. If you want a specific finish, you tend to play with the iron content and the copper content, uh, whether you want a bright finish or a matte finish. So these could be profiles that are non-structural but are just used for uh, aesthetic purposes. And then if you want to increase the strength, of course, you, you increase the magnesium and silicon content. So I guess as we add those alloying elements, you know, what, what we find is the higher strength alloys are higher strength, you know, even prior to an extrusion. And as a result, um, they are harder to extrude. It's a higher flow stress which means the press is working harder and the material is exiting the press at a lower speed. Um, so it's just something to be, to consider, uh, I go back to the Lotus example. It's possible that low volume vehicle, there was some price consciousness there. As you move into these high strength alloys, the amount of material that can be produced per unit of time typically is reduced and therefore you will typically um, pay a higher conversion cost, which is the cost that an extruder is charging you to take a pound or a kilogram of raw material and turn it into your shape. So there's a, just one more factor to consider if you're, you know, balancing between two alloys. If one of them is a little bit softer, a little bit lower uh, strength, it's also likely going to be a slightly lower conversion cost. So definitely something to, to be aware of and to think about when picking materials. So on alloy, you know, we've talked about alloy, we talked about temper. Here's examples of parts being used in a system that are different materials. So just because the part beside something is 6061 or 6063 doesn't mean the others are. Um, there's areas where you need that those mechanical properties and areas where you don't. And being vigilant and selecting the right alloy in the right place will help lead to that total cost solution we talked about. Um, make sure you're not just designating an alloy, but also specifying a temper. So that, that metal has um, different metallurgy potentially going in, but how it's processed through the extrusion process from the preheat temperature to the quench and to the artificial aging cycle that's done on it is really what's going to guarantee um, the product performance that you're looking for. And, and going along those lines, you can have a different alloy or you can have the same alloy, but behave differently because of the way the chemical composition is designed. Uh, eventually, you know, the way you extrude it, it yields different uh, microstructure. You can gain anything from recrystallized uh, to a fibrous grain structure. And uh, as, as Ben mentioned, when you look at tempers and you're, you're looking at the overall picture with the uh, uh, the capabilities and, and how the extrusion press uh, performs um, and the mechanical properties and, and how uh, you want the alloy to behave, you can decide um, which kind of alloys are best suited and which kind of microstructure is best suited for those applications. So over here is an example of a 6082 uh, with varying manganese content. Uh, and it really shows uh, how the microstructure changes and evolves uh, based on the chemical composition. 
Uh, same thing if we if we look at it, this uh, uh, on the left side you have a fibrous uh, ga grain structure. You can see it's in alignment with the the um, direction of uh, your extrusion. And on, on B, you have a more recrystallized uh, structure. And again, as I mentioned, it depends on the alloy composition and the extrusion process. So there's some, some examples here. Uh, you know, these are just images and this really stems like far beyond the content of today's presentation, but we just wanted to highlight um, that, you know, fabrication, joining, Tolerances. These are discussions you can have with your with your extruder. A lot of extruders are very well set up to do the secondary processing on extrusions because it's what they're doing every day. Um, although there are some guidelines with respect to you know what fabrication, what joining methods, what tolerances can be achieved. So much of it is profile based that it's you know you're going to have better results, more application specific results if you open that conversation at the design phase. And I know if you're working with a member of the AEC, uh, those are conversations that are gonna be welcome to have with you um, long before there's any you know, commitment or guarantee of business. Examples of you know, what some of those questions might be or, or how that conversation can evolve um, you know, are shown here. So the, the profile geometry looked relatively simple, but turns out that there's going to be certain areas of this part that require post manufacturing. There might be a surface that's going to have um, something welded to it. There might be a section that's going to have something bonded to it. And as a result, the extruder will be able to provide input as to um, what type of surface finish they're going to target in an area, how the porting on the tool is going to be set up so that you get, you know, no weld lines um, along a certain face that potentially has um, critical requirements for a welding operation and things like that. So um, the, the takeaway here is to, is to keep asking questions and to ask them to ask them early. So um, we've talked about the AC a few times. Uh, this is such a great tool that you have available. Um, I, I highly recommend that you download um, this extrusion manual. It's gonna give you a bunch of just general information about extrusion, the processes and applications that can be done designing. But as you um, familiarize yourself, not which is the manual, but the AC website, it'll also help guide you towards best suited suppliers for certain products um, and, and material suppliers and things like that. So if you're working on or evolving towards more aluminum intensive products, um, this is a resource that you're gonna to wanna to have uh, in your back pocket. So <clears throat> we're getting close to the end here. Um, we're gonna take some time to talk a little bit about carbon. Being in the extrusion industry uh, myself, it's certainly a topic we hear increasingly. You know, People are interested in what's the carbon footprint of this? What options do I have? And so we, you know, we wanted to give you a, a little bit of information about that uh, as it's likely something that your customers are starting to ask as well. Yep, so as Ben mentioned, a lot of the OEMs have, uh, you know, decarbonization targets, whether it's 2030, 2035, 2040, whatever you may you may have it. Uh, really that the targets are that they wanna reduce their carbon footprint and not just them, they wanna trickle it down through their supply chain. Um, you know, the AEC actually conducted um, a study last year, and it's an industry-wide study. And that the, what the data showed was that the for the mill finish, the global warming potential ends up being close to 10.26 kilograms of uh, carbon dioxide per kilogram. Uh, out of that, the extrusion process itself really only accounts for about 7.8 or I want to say close to 20, 20, 25%. Um, the prime material data, the rest of it is actually uh, from the electrolysis process, the smelting process that produces you know, molten aluminum that eventually gets cast as, uh, as billets. So when you look at the prime uh, material data from North America, 80% of the material that's produced in North America is produced with hydropower 
Uh, 17% of it is from coal and 3% of it is uh, from, from others. Now, if we, if what, what we, what you can do um, to reduce this is specify recycled content. And what we can see in, in the market these days is that the OEMs have started to look more and more towards recycled content. And they're specifying that in their specifications. Um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, specify the absolute minimum recycled content that uh, the billet needs to have. Uh, some OEMs in Europe actually have also started to specify um, approved smelters or approved uh, vendors that uh, their supply chain can purchase uh, material from. So as an extruder or as, as an extruder, what you can do is uh, you can request uh, the carbon offset data from your uh, billet supplier. Uh, and if we look at uh, the prime material, uh, the baseline, industry baseline, tends to be close to eight uh, ton or eight kilograms uh, of uh, CO2. Uh, if we look at China and India, that uh, number goes uh, above 14. Um, really, I'm, I'm kind of used to using tons per uh, tons per. Uh, uh, ton of aluminum produced. So uh, we look at the Middle East, they're using gas powered, uh, tends to be close to eight and a half to nine. Um, and then you have uh, products in, in available that certify less than four tons of aluminum or four tons of CO2 per ton of aluminum produced. And, you know, I know other vendors do it too, but Rio Tinto definitely has products where we can certify uh, the billet being lower lower than four tons of CO2 produced uh, for every ton of aluminum. Oh, yeah, a very cool uh, step forward and advancement there. So I'm going to kind of summarize these last few slides uh, just to leave a bit of time for Q&A. But when talking about car carbon, you know, the recyclability aluminum of aluminum is a key point to make. And, it, you know, studies have been done to show that 91% of aluminum that is used in auto manufacturing does end up getting recycled. So you have a really high recyclability rate, um, which is which is fantastic. There's a lot of questions around capacity with this growing demand for extrusion. Um, what we can say is that, you know, over the next year or so, because we're already like partway through this data set, but there are um, tens of new extrusion lines coming online um, even even this year, um, operated by over 110 companies at, at a number of different locations across North America. So we're seeing that trend and we are responding to it. Uh, capacity is going to be there. We talked about asking questions. These are just examples of questions to ask. You can reference them later, but most importantly is engage a, supp a supplier or a potential supplier, start asking questions, and lean on them to help you to help you solve your problems. There's a ton of value in that, and there's a ton of knowledge uh, housed with the manufacturers that they are happy uh, and interested in sharing with you. So, you know, we can tell that uh, extrusion is going to play an increasing role in vehicles, whether it's uh, EVs or ICEs or BEVs. Um, that is the way the future efficiency is is critical for all of them. And it's going to be one of the more sustainable options, um, especially as companies invest in, in low carbon aluminum, uh, as suppliers select and choose low carbon aluminum, and as uh, you know, with the infrastructure of recycling that exists for aluminum, uh, it's well set up. These are the members of the AC's automotive team um, that would have been a component of uh, putting together the content in this presentation. So thank you um, to all of those involved. Just to give you a snapshot, here is a bigger group of all the members in the AEC um, and companies that would be interested in working with you. Um, so we hope we hope to hear from you. And uh, just finally, uh, we are ready for some questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, before we begin with the q and I just want to ask everyone to direct their attention to the webinar survey on the right-hand side of the presentation window. And if you close the survey, you can pop that widget back open by clicking the icon on the bottom of your screen. And again, thanks. Your feedback um, lets us better serve you. Now let's get on to our Q&A. As a reminder, to participate, just 
type your question into the text box located to the right of the window or click the Q&A icon and the ones we don't have time for uh, we will pass to our speakers to get a, a written response later. Let me start off with a question from Andrew who says, you mentioned vanadium in 6008 causing complication in recycling. Does the zinc content in 6082 also cause issues or is the 0.1% low enough to alleviate issues with other alloys? I can I can take that. Um, yes, yeah, so the 6008 vanadium, it becomes an issue and that's that's the reason why you have to segregate that scrap. Uh, similarly, with if you go around the extruders, they tend to segregate 6082 as well, and, and mm -hmm. zinc is the reason for that. Um, when, when you walk around an extrusion facility, you'll often see 6060, 6063 uh, scrap being in the same bin, but 6082 tends to be in a different bin, and that's exactly why. So. Uh, it, it is on the smaller side, but it's it's good enough. Uh, it's high enough to affect the other other products. Thanks for that. Keep the questions coming. Uh, this from Martin, who says, "What are the most detrimental chemical elements to pay attention to when incorporating scrap into the billets?" Uh, same, same. I would say um, zinc and uh, and vanadium. Uh, zinc mm -hmm. tends to tends to really affect and cause an issue. What we call spangling. Um, and we can we can touch on that later, but that's really uh, the, the issue, the main thing. John, wants I would, to know, is I there, would, oh, go ahead. I would, just, I would just add to that, you know, it depends on um, what that material is being recycled for. If it's being recycled to go into a, a high visual application, then high iron concentrations can be a concern. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that would be more application specific, but just worth noting. Okay. Absolutely, Ben. Thank you. Keep the questions coming. Uh, John wants to know if there's an ideal rate to ratio, uh, rate ratio of weight to volume. That's a really good question. Um, I think there probably is a theoretical sweet spot. Um, we talk about in extrusion a lot is reduction ratio. So what's the ratio of the, the surface area, the billet relative to the profile? Um, however, it's one of those things where like the theory can be misleading because the complexity of the geometry and, and how the tool needs to be designed is probably a bigger factor. So um, I would I would stem away from focusing on like designing something on a specific weight to surface area ratio and um, bring that geometry idea to, to a customer or to a potential supplier and say, based on this geometry, you know, what surface area is going to alleviate or create like the, a lower cost condition if that is indeed what you're trying to achieve. Here's a question that asks, how far does aluminum extruded microchannel tubes stay in an advantageous situation compared with fusion bonded sheet heat exchangers in aluminum? So I'm not too familiar with the fusion bonded sheet heat exchanger uh, operation, but I, I can say in terms of uh, uh, extruded microchannel tube, the, the advantages are that you can typically run eight to 10 strands uh, from a single die and they end up coiling uh, on large coils and which can further get uh, cut into to pieces for your customers. Uh, the best part is you can interchange the 3000 series alloys uh, based on your corrosion resistance requirements. And those small pieces of microport uh, extrusions will typically get uh, brazed uh, and with, with foil to provide the, the, the heat uh, dissipation. We just have a couple of minutes left. I'll try and squeeze in a few more questions and we will get a written response to the ones we don't have time for afterwards. Andrew asks, how is homogenization measured? Is it the center of the billet? Is the center of the billet a different measurement than near the outer skin? So homogenization is really measured uh, from the temperature of the homogenization furnace. So when you stack billets uh, or logs that go into the homogenization furnace, there's typically a ramp up time that goes to a certain temperature. Then you soak the entire load uh, for a required temperature uh, and then you cool it down. So a lot of times you can control your homogenization practice and that really can dictate the performance of the billet. Uh, a poorly homogenized billet may not perform as well as a, a properly or a better homogenized billet. 
And with that, uh, that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you. We appreciate your time and expertise, gentlemen, on today's topic. Also, thanks to our sponsor, the Aluminum Extruders Council, as well as to everyone in the audience. We appreciate your attention and participation. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been able to listen to the event live. This webinar is copyright 2023 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Informa Markets, and our individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions on behalf of our guests, Ben and, and, and Sarab. I'm Michael Krieger. Thanks for your time, and have a great day.